Welcome to Project Combat, a new series that aims to realize the potential of RuneScape's combat system. Each episode will explore a major topic, outline opportunities for improvements, and encourage ongoing combat discussions that involve both players and developers. Project Combat's ultimate goal is to provide Jagex with clear, actionable feedback that will drive fundamental improvements to RuneScape's combat system. Combat is an incredibly extensive, complex topic. Complex topics require complex solutions, and there are endless systems at play here. Improving the feel of combat as a whole is going to take time, and will likely need to be tackled in batches, which is apparently a curse word on the RuneScape subreddit. This episode's topic is combat readability, clarity, intuitive gameplay, and player satisfaction. Talking about these topics together makes sense because of how intertwined they are. But before that, since this is the series' first episode, we'll start with some background on how we got here and why this series was created. If you don't care about the history and want to skip over to this episode's topic, timestamps are available below. On November 20th, 2012, Jagex launched the Evolution of Combat, a total rework of RuneScape's combat system. The update saw massive controversy, and the general consensus among the player base is that the launch was rather scuffed. We saw sweeping changes to the fundamentals of combat. Changes to fundamentals like the combat level formula ultimately made the game not feel like RuneScape anymore. On February 14th, 2014, Jagex launched Revolution, a fix to the rather input-intensive experience combat had become. Revolution allows for abilities to be automatically fired off, rather than requiring players to manually input each attack. Many players thought Revolution was a feature that should have been a part of EOC's launch, and would have improved player reception. RuneScape players love AFK potential, and momentum just never felt good enough. Although there were a lot more issues with EOC than just being input intensive. On July 14th, 2014, Jagex launched global combat improvements alongside Legacy Combat, a first in a series of fundamental reworks that improved the feel of combat and brought back some of what made RuneScape feel like RuneScape, including strength bonuses, the 138 combat formula, and the classic special attacks that many of us so dearly missed. This update was preceded by a long beta, where Jagex took player feedback seriously and made much needed improvements to the feel of combat. Still, after these combat improvements, there were concerns around things like weapon diversity, class diversity, readability, and more. Jagex has since introduced new abilities that have more interesting gameplay, given each combat style something unique and meaningful, and has continued to slowly address these feedback points. On September 16th, 2015, Darkscape was announced, an all-PVP version of the game that uses the Legacy combat system. Unfortunately, Legacy mode carried over with it a number of faults from EOC. Players rallied because the idea was amazing, but combat needed help, and Jagex responded with an incredible opportunity for player-developer collaboration around improving combat. Jagex launched changes in the Darkscape environment that were actually really well received, targeting topics like class diversity and the combat triangle. Sadly, the interest in Darkscape just wasn't there. The game needed far too many PvP combat improvements before it could attract and retain players. Although the project didn't work out, the experience inspired Jagex to continue developing and improving the combat system. Today, we have seen continued improvements that build on top of what we have. Things like Greater Barge, Sentistan Spells, Enchanted Backbolts, and new special attacks that change how we think about the combat experience. On June 4th, 2019, Jagex trialed a weapon diversity beta, but ultimately the concept was scrapped. I agree with the decision to scrap the concept, the changes were mostly DPS focused and as Jagex described, didn't meaningfully improve how the combat system was approached. The response also wasn't overwhelmingly positive, but since then, not much has gone out in the way of changes to how existing combat works. The beta did have positive impact though, leading to the introduction of niche passives on new weapons, like spears that increase the duration of bleeds, which excites players beyond just the tier of new gear there are still an incredibly high number of faults with the combat system. Topics like the tick system or death costs come up a lot, although both of these have been addressed in some way by Jagex. Most importantly, the improvements we have seen over the past five years build on top of what we have. Project Combat explores issues that are fundamental. They won't be addressed by just a new weapon or ability. Project Combat is an opportunity to recreate that incredible darkscape player-developer relationship that ultimately led to well-received combat improvements. More importantly, this series will focus on what makes combat feel good, especially for new players. With the release of mobile, the new player experience is a very hot topic, which makes it feel like the perfect time for this series. 
Project Combat will be a huge effort put forth by both players and Jagex, but when I see the success of reworks like mining and smithing, which you often see new players invest a lot of time into, particularly because the rework was so well done, I'm confident that the RuneScape community and Jagex can pull this off. One last important point. You may not agree with everything I have to say, and the solutions that I mention are not necessarily the best solution to the issues that I outline, and that's okay. They're meant to act as jump-off points that encourage discussion. I consider this episode's topic to be the least controversial, but for future topics, sometimes people might just hard disagree with a point that I make. I encourage everyone who wants to get involved in this project to listen with intent and provide meaningful feedback. Always remember, our goal is to improve the game, not seek personal benefits. Now, let's finally get into this episode's topic. First, we'll quickly define each term, starting with clarity and readability. The clarity of a game is how well a player can understand what's happening in a given situation and how to appropriately respond. Clarity can be delivered to players through a combination of audio and visual cues. This can include visual effects, animations, hit splats, pop-up texts, and interfaces. Complex rules can be made easier to understand using these cues. Intuition. Good clarity allows for an intuitive player experience. If a player can understand what is happening to them in a given scenario, they're more likely to respond appropriately. The experience feels more fluid and fun as the game plays out in an expected, intuitive way. Clarity and intuitive gameplay are particularly important for new players. The new player combat experience is less overwhelming if new players receive easy to understand cues that make intuitive sense. Player satisfaction. It's the emotional response to something happening in the game. This is that awesome feeling a player can get when they correctly deal with a mechanic or fulfill a fantasy. A great example of good player satisfaction is Ice Barrage. The sound effect associated with Ice Barrage is a classic, and it's quite visually appealing to summon a giant chunk of ice on a target. These three ideologies are heavily intertwined, which is why we're covering them all in this episode. When these ideologies are not properly adhered to, player feedback might not necessarily respond appropriately. If clarity and readability or player satisfaction are lacking, you might get indirect or generic feedback like, this feels clunky, I don't know, it's just not interesting, I don't know what's going on, or this just isn't cool enough. RuneScape suffers from tons of cases wherein clarity is seriously lacking. As someone so eloquently put it on a Reddit comment, the combat readability in this game is atrocious. As a result, player intuition is negatively affected and player satisfaction drops. These three ideologies are extremely important for new and mid-game players, especially those who are interested in learning some mid to end game PVM. A lack of clarity turns people off PVM and the game in general. Before we get into a ton of combat examples where clarity can be improved, I want to show that Jagex does understand these ideologies. We'll use the recent-ish mining rework as a quick example. Rocks can be prospected to provide clear information about their statistics. If a player tries to mine a rock that they don't have a sufficient pickaxe level for, they're appropriately warned. A player has a clear progress bar that shows how far from their next ore they are. A stamina bar clearly drains on hit and is associated with a particular swing animation that sounds good. When the stamina bar runs out, the animation changes, XP is reduced, and the swing animation sound gets weaker. Rock opportunities are clearly presented to the player with both a visual and a sound effect. Players that interact with the rock opportunity are given a hit splat that shows their reward, as well as a big XP drop, which all equate to player satisfaction. Mining is a fantastic example of these ideologies at work. This makes the content accessible to new players and encourages them to keep going because they understand what's happening and they know when they did something right. Combat is obviously more complex than mining. However, the recent mining rework demonstrates that Jagex has the ability to constructively critique their own gameplay systems take in player feedback, and improve upon them in a way that encourages player satisfaction through clear and intuitive gameplay mechanics. We'll start with general combat readability problems. As I work through these, you'll notice that many of these topics are mentioned in the PVM Discord, a community of incredible RuneScape players who have combed through every intricacy and nuance of combat. They've tested it, documented it, and shared their results with a greater community. A reoccurring issue is that players shouldn't need to read through a manual to understand how mechanics like AoEs, auto attacks, and ability interactions work. Most of this should be intuitive, at least enough that a player can make it to end game PVM by learning and progressing on their own. 
Many of these combat mechanics that have become standard for endgame PVM, like weaving an auto in during non-damaging abilities, are really difficult to discover and learn on your own. The intuitive sense just isn't there. Combat becomes a game of remembering to utilize these clunky, unintuitive interactions to maximize DPS. There is a huge disparity in DPS between a player who is making use of these unintuitive interactions and a player who is only using what they've intuitively discovered from playing the game. For those super competitive PVMers watching right now, I am not suggesting that DPSing or end game PVM should become easier or that everyone should be doing maximum DPS with minimum input. Rather, if a mechanic exists in the game that notably improves a player's DPS, it should be clear, accessible, and intuitive. A great example of complex but accessible DPS boosting mechanics are the passive effects of the new spells Incite Fear and Exsanguinate. A player can intuitively recognize an opportunity to switch between the spells and maintain two different stack sets to juggle their benefits. The problem is, if I have to review a PVM Discord manual to understand how AoEs work, the nuance behind abilities and auto attack weaving, and the fact that weapon overrides can affect your damage hit delay, then player intuition and combat readability are in need of serious help. Players trying out the game will refer to combat as clunky, confusing, or they'll just lose interest. I will cover a few of the nuances that the PVM Discord outlines, but I encourage Jagex to spend some serious time on each nuance and decide whether it's worth keeping in the game, and if it is, how do you improve clarity and intuition around that mechanic? Weapon Tooltips the UI that appears when you hover over combat gear is misleading. Damage is a confusing stat to show players, especially new ones. It represents auto attack damage, but most of us know ability damage is what really matters. It's confusing for new players to see two weapons have different damage values, despite them actually doing the same damage when they're casting abilities. Most new players won't notice or care about auto attacks since they're not used much until late game PVM. In RuneScape, the global cooldown is the same regardless of weapon speed. So weapon speed can be further misleading since, with Revolution, all weapons actually have the same speed. In RuneScape, weapon speed is almost exclusively used for tick manipulation of average speed autos, which I'll get into later. Magic weapon tooltips have zero information on damage potential. You have to first set a spell and then check your ability damage stats. If you compare a Lunar Staff, which says level 65, to an Ancient Staff, which says level 50, they have the same accuracy. Do they have the same damage too? This Ceridoman Staff says level 60, but it also has much higher accuracy. How does its damage compare? We also have cases like Wand of the Cywar Elders, which has tier 90 accuracy, but only tier 80 damage. This isn't communicated to players through tooltips. Spells and damage scaling are even less clear. With ranged, if you equip ammo which is a higher tier compared to your weapon, you get a helpful clear pop-up that notifies you your damage is actually capped, although this can be annoying with backrimental bolts. Magic doesn't have this notification, and even worse, spells scale up in damage, so that level 41 air blast is actually good to use until your staff damage tier potential is level 62 or higher, but players receive no notice or information about this, and they're even misled into thinking unlocking a new spell, like Fire Blast at level 59, improves their damage in some way. It doesn't. Here's a potential quick fix to the magic spell issue. Let's say someone equips a magic weapon and selects a spell whose tier is too high or too low. If they're not in combat, a pop-up can offer to set the player's spell to an appropriate tier, either moving it up or down. For example, if I'm wielding a Gothic Staff and set my spell to Water Wave, a pop-up could offer to set my spell to Water Blast since it has the same damage at a lower rune cost. This doesn't solve all the clarity issues around magic spells, but it at least prevents new players from running into a combat encounter with objectively incorrect spells. I do want to give a shout out to Jagex for recently adding weapon range to tooltips. It's a good step forward, but the points I outlined still need to be addressed. Let's talk about ability tooltips. Jagex has actually done a great job of improving ability tooltips. They're overall much cleaner, organized, and accurate, but there's still room for improvement. There are some examples of misleading, missing, or straight-up incorrect text. For example, Fury says you can gain 5% crit strike chance on your next ability, but the stacking crit strike chance actually applies to every channeled hit of Fury. Destroy and Asphyxiate actually have a guaranteed stun on the first hit, even if the ability misses. This isn't mentioned anywhere. 
Flurry's tooltip says the ability lasts 3.6 seconds, but it actually takes 4.2 seconds of channeling to get off all hits. Damage enhancing abilities like Berserk or Sunshine don't affect damage over time abilities, but this is never mentioned to players. Rack straight up lies to you. A powerful attack? That's like saying uncut gems would be worth more cut. It's the weakest magic ability, and you should almost never use it without a bind, but the flavor text can mislead new players. These are just a few examples of tooltips that are missing information or misleading in some way. The RuneScape Wiki and PVM Discord communities have done an incredible job of documenting how abilities actually work. Jagex should consider working with these communities to update ability tooltips for improved accuracy. Let's talk about revolution bars. When non-PVM experts post screenshots on the RuneScape subreddit, a common top-rated comment I see is, what the hell is that revolution bar? Yeah, slice and punish back to back while wearing a shield. In the early to mid game, most abilities boil down to just deal damage, especially against stun immune targets. Your ability order has a massive impact on your overall DPS. Because of this, there are objectively correct revolution bars until you start to unlock more complex and situational abilities. Players inexperienced with combat aren't adequately provided optimal revolution bar information, and so they often end up using bad revolution bars, especially as they level up and new abilities are randomly added to their bars. To make DPS more accessible, Jagex should provide players with optimal revolution bars. These bars already exist on the RuneScape wiki, but this way, we ensure unaware players are not using awful revolution bars. Addressing this makes combat generally more accessible for early to mid-game players by bringing their DPS up to a baseline acceptable level. Next up, buff and debuff icons have room for clarity improvements. Buff durations are displayed in seconds, but this can be confusing as the game works off 0.6 second cycles or ticks. The client refreshes the seconds left on a buff, but players benefit more from being in tune with ticks rather than seconds. To address this, Buff durations should have some sort of visual, non-number timer that updates with every tick, like darkening the icon from the bottom up as its time left decreases. Buffs also have no warning that they're expiring soon. A flashing effect and a continuously darkening buff icon would better convey that a buff is about to run out. On targets, debuffs have no duration indicator. An indicator of duration would be particularly useful for debuffs like Bound and Vulnerable, especially if you're looking to use a stun-enhanced ability on a Bound target. Darkening the debuff icon from the bottom up as the duration expires would help convey how much time is left. Some debuffs are completely unnecessary. For example, Binding Shot applies two different debuffs. For some reason, Binding Shot is one of the debuffs, but that icon doesn't communicate anything meaningful. Cleaning up how buff icons convey information is a big win for combat readability across the board. Next up, shields. Putting it bluntly, shields are noob traps. They have absolutely no value in the early to mid game at all. Generally, players are far better off DPSing down all early to mid game mobs and bosses. A shield switch is both unintuitive and unnecessary. However, shields are a cool fantasy, and new players can easily be drawn into using a shield. The impact on DPS of an offhand versus a shield can be unclear to a new player, because the only thing that changes for them is access to one or two more abilities. Most non-dual wielding abilities don't even make use of the offhand in their animation, which could suggest that it's not doing anything. The only visual difference is slightly higher damage splats, which is even less noticeable in the early game. The cool fantasy of shield usage is just never optimal, but this isn't communicated well to new players. I don't actually have a good solution to this, but it's a conversation worth having as it affects new players the most. Let's talk about targeting next. In most MMOs with tab targeting, tab is the key you use to target, hence the name. Tab targeting means your character selects a target and all attacks are launched at your target. I actually have no idea what the default target cycle keybind is in RuneScape. So for anyone who's used to MMORPGs, RuneScape is considered a tab targeting game but it doesn't let you use tab to target, and intuitively, MMORPG players will try tab to switch targets, but tab is hard bound to respond to your most recent DM from someone probably trying to scam you. Targeting in RuneScape is never fully explained, and it's definitely unintuitive. I think the yellow circle means you are targeting an NPC, and the red circle means that the NPC is targeting you. That's what I thought, but I'm actually not sure, and I genuinely don't know what's going on here. 
When I looked up targeting on the wiki, it showed me an article about skill targets. I couldn't find anything in the PVM Discord beyond a section about target cycling, but it focuses on the cycling aspect. Even worse, target cycling in RuneScape is server-sided, meaning when you try to target cycle, nothing will happen until the next game tick. And if you input more than one target cycle command, you end up with glitchy visuals. The target circle can also be really difficult to see in combat, especially with mobs. I can't easily tell who I'm hitting in any given moment, particularly with areas that have lots of mobs. All of this contributes to the feedback that players give wherein they say combat feels clunky. I do know that the most accurate way to tell who you're targeting is by who has the visible health bar. But if you hover your mouse over anything, a very similar but slightly less long health bar appears and you quickly lose visual track of who you're on. Sometimes killing a mob doesn't update its health bar correctly and they die with some health left. When more than one player is hitting a mob, this can cause multiple mobs to die with health left, which conveys inaccurate information to players. Targeting, clarity around status of mobs, and clarity on who you are focusing needs a full pass to improve how combat flows and feels for all players. Next up, let's talk about area of effects, or AoEs. AoEs in RuneScape seriously lack visual clarity. The tiles that an ability or mechanic can affect are often misaligned with the visuals. Let's first provide some context on what contributes to AoEs feeling so clunky, and the infamous question of why am I taking damage from Carapac's stupid lightning walls? The servers store the current location of an NPC, effect, and player as a coordinate or tile. When you issue a command to move two squares over, on the next game tick, your position is updated to the new tile and your client catches up by running your model from your current location to the new server location. From the perspective of the server, as soon as that cycle happens, your character is already on the new tile. While you're running, this means that you skipped over one tile and you were never actually, from the server's perspective, on the tile in between. This applies to effects like Carapax Lightning Wall as well. Because of this effect, the hitbox line is actually slightly ahead of where the graphic is playing on your client since the hitbox line moves first and the client catches up. This also applies to mobs, particularly those that have an attack animation which doesn't allow for movement. The mob will poke you and stop walking, but the server says that the mob is still moving, and it starts poking you from three tiles away. We then combine these issues of mob movement and AoE location to the clarity issues of abilities like Dragon Breath, and you end up with atrocious combat readability. All of this becomes incredibly more complex when you encounter a mob that takes up more than one tile. So mobs that take up 2x2 two two or 3x3 three three have a true center of their most southwest tile. Any AoE abilities won't actually hit the mob right next to your target, unless they're southwest. The only way to learn about this nuance is by digging through the PVM Discord. This is a great example of poor player intuition. Name another MMORPG or game with a combat system where you had to look up how an AoE actually works because it didn't work the way you expected. How the hell does Dragon Breath actually work? Where is the mob that I'm targeting actually located? Why did that mob get hit but the other one didn't? Why the hell am I taking damage right now? These questions run through a player's head when they don't understand what's going on and it turns them off the game. One last example, Death Swiftness. The AoE suggests it's slightly greater than 3x3, with the corners of the 5x5 being clearly out of the AoE. However, they still work. Then you take another step and realize that the AoE is actually 7x7. Nowhere in the tooltip does it explain this, and there's no reason for a player to think that they would still be under the effects at that range. The only way to really tell is the buff icon being visible, but even then, Players might not trust that this icon is accurate given all the other inconsistencies that they'll discover by the time they unlock this ability. Circle AoEs in general are unclear because RuneScape uses a square, tile-based grid system. We shouldn't be afraid to embrace the grid system and use tile effects to accurately show where damage occurred for player-used abilities and boss effects. At some point, Mod Pi had to use cabbages to show how Dragon Breath works, and honestly, I still don't really get it. This isn't an easy topic to address, but there are quick win opportunities around AoE clarities like Dragon Breath and Death Swiftness, and threat visual effects to at least ensure players know what's going on and understand why they're taking damage. Animations and visual effects can fail to keep up with abilities. 
This desync makes combat look clunky and tough to read. The most obvious example is this basic ranged ability rotation. I use Corruption Shot, Needle Strike, I start channeling Snipe but the animation is delayed, and by the time it preps, the ability has already finished channeling. This desync can even happen with a single ability use. A destroy is a good example. Any channeled ability can lead to some sort of visual effect and animation desync. Combat visual effects that appear on a target can also override each other if they try to play on the same cycle. Shadow Tendrils is aggressive in overriding other effects. Whether it's used second or first, Shadow Tendrils visual effect overrides both Fragmentation Shot and Corruption Shot. Even worse, Shadow Tendrils visual effect actually has no value or meaning. It suggests that there's some sort of damage over time effect, but really the hit happens with the projectile, a projectile that looks like every other ranged ability. I'll go into more detail on these particular ability cases in the next section, but this general channeled ability desync and visual effect override contributes to the reduction of player satisfaction and combat readability. Speaking of projectiles, they've been wonky ever since EOC, particularly for attacks that have quick impact times. Let's go over how visuals and animations work in RuneScape before exploring this in more detail. Each ability is made up of visual effects and animations. The animation is your character moving, and the visual effect is the pretty stuff that happens around you and your target. Using Sonic Wave as an example, each cast of Sonic Wave has one animation and three separate visual effects. A visual effect that complements the animation, a projectile, and an impact effect. With the evolution of combat, projectiles were sped up quite a bit compared to old school RuneScape, but the underlying mechanics of how projectiles work was never improved, and projectiles were never intended to travel so quickly. This results in glitchy projectile visual effects. The closer you are to your target, the greater the projectile arc, and if you're right next to your target, that arc looks bad and it also has a glitchy interaction on impact. Using the magic ability impact as an example, the damage appears one tick after the ability is cast, but this isn't enough time for the initial animation and the visual effects to play along with the projectile. The end result is a mismatch of three visual effects which were intended to be played in a particular order, and the impact visual effect appears way before the projectile connects. This combination of glitchy visuals and animations worsens combat readability, damages the player fantasy of feeling like you're engaging in these cool combat animations, and ultimately hurts the player experience because combat just looks and feels off. Aftershock is another great example of visual effects appearing way after the hit splat had already been applied. All of this makes combat feel very desynced and clunky. This can apply to sound effects as well. The best example is eating food. If you click a piece of food, the sound effect of eating plays even if you didn't actually eat. That means you can spam click on a piece of food and constantly hear the eating sound. That eating sound is considered an audio cue, and a player could incorrectly assume that they ate a piece of food because they heard the sound cue. Let's take a closer look at individual abilities now. This isn't an exhaustive list of abilities that have clarity or satisfaction issues, but the goal here is to showcase how most abilities have some sort of clarity issue or an opportunity to improve player satisfaction. First and foremost, ability icons are a little dated. The art style for ability icons is kind of random, low res, and overall just weird, especially for older abilities. Jagex recently gave Rack and Concentrated Blast ability icons a refresh which is awesome to see. The new Concentrated Blast and Greater Concentrated Blast have fantastic ability icons. They're clear, high quality, and reflective of the ability. Three hits, three spheres. Some icons, like Fury, it's just a skull. It, it doesn't hint at anything towards what the ability actually does. Snipe is someone standing in front of a fan. Decimate is a fist. A dual wielding ability is a fist. Assault is just a hammer. Are we smithing? Destroy looks like the trap card Ring of Destruction. I still can't figure out what anticipation is. It looks like a hooded banshee holding a sword. Dragon Breath looks like a dude with a bad hair day kind of vomiting up hot sauce. The first ranged ultimate players have access to in this game? A goblin. Slaughter kind of looks like a meme. 
Uh, hurricane is a tornado? I honestly don't know what massacre is supposed to be. I just see like a low pixel dagger. Joking aside, many of these ability icons are almost a decade old now, and these icons sit on our screen most of our playtime. Each ability icon should be given a refresh or complete redesign. Players want cool looking icons that excite them when a new ability is unlocked. Let's talk about channeled attacks now. I briefly mentioned these in the animation section earlier. This includes anything that has channeled attack in the ability tooltip. So abilities like Fury, Snipe, Assault, Concentrated Blast, Asphyxiate, etc. All these channeled attacks have shared visual clarity and intuitive sense issues. Visuals and audio cues are confusing, misleading, or glitchy. The damage hit times are not clear. The channel duration and timing of the abilities is also unclear. The cancelling mechanic is inconsistent and non-intuitive. I've been bullying Fury a lot, but I'm going to keep going. The animation has the player cutting four times with four impact sounds before the second hit splat even appears. The animation also glitches out because it's the same animation as Assault, but cut short. There's also no meaningful sound or animation that coincides with the hit splats appearing, so it's difficult for a player to follow along on what's happening because the animation, sound effects, and hit splats are completely out of sync, and all of this hurts intuition. Rapid fire animations and sound effects can't even keep up with the fire rate, although at least the projectile and hit splats are accurately timed. Unload shows twice as many launches as damage splats, with an audio cue that doesn't make sense. Asphyxiate probably has the best channel animation, but still generally suffers from channel ability confusion around hit splats and cancelling. For any channeled ability you use, a player should almost always use their next ability in the same tick that the last hit of the channeled ability lands. There's no reason not to. Revolution actually now does this cancelling for you, although this wasn't always the case. And some abilities, like Snipe, still waste a cycle. But none of this is clear to the player, and for some channeled abilities like Concentrated Blast and Fury, it's generally more DPS to actually cancel the channel by queuing another ability immediately to build adrenaline faster. These visual inconsistencies and clunky animations need to be cleaned up. Jagex can make beautiful animations. We've seen it with agility courses in recent times. Combat just hasn't been given much animation and visual love over the past decade. Typically, games with channeled abilities use a visual channel bar that gives players a better opportunity to grasp the rhythmic timing of an ability. RuneScape's channeled ability clarity could benefit from a channel bar that is divided up by game cycles to better showcase when a channel is ending and when the hits will actually be applied. Ideally, this bar can update in a flow rather than chunking down each cycle, but making ticks clear on channel bars could improve readability and intuition because players can understand the connection between a visual channel bar ticks and the hit spots appearing. That's not to say a channel bar is the correct solution. It'll likely be some combination of solutions that addresses the overall issues with channeled abilities. Next, we'll go through each combat style and their associated abilities to identify opportunities for readability and player satisfaction improvements. I want to apologize beforehand if it comes off like I'm bashing Jagex here. That's definitely not the intention. I know the incredibly intricate and beautiful animations and visual effects that Jagex can produce. Much of the animations and visuals I'm going to go through haven't changed since the evolution of combat beta. Many newer abilities also just reuse these animations, so the problem compounds on itself. One quick important note, we want to also be mindful of too much visual noise. When I suggest improving clarity by adding a visual effect, we can actually go too far in the other direction and overwhelm the player with visual noise. Maintaining this balance is crucial. We prioritize the visual effects based on their impact and importance. We'll begin with melee abilities. We've bullied Fury enough this episode, so let's start with Slice and Punish, because they're basically the same ability. These abilities have an added effect wherein they deal bonus damage when striking a bound target. However, there's no positive feedback for using these abilities on a bound target. No special hit splat, no unique animation, no audio cue. And so when players correctly make use of an ability's unique effect, there needs to be a positive feedback to reaffirm the combo. In this case, you could either reward the player with maybe two hit splats, a guaranteed crit, some sort of combo text that appears, or just generally a more satisfying sound or animation. 
Havoc has no special effects in PVM, but the ability sound effect, it kind of sounds like you're whiffing the target. The animation in general is a bit uninteresting, and the satisfying sound is just not there. Because it's a low cooldown, frequently used ability, it's important that it sounds and looks good. Decimate. The sound is alright, but it's nothing special. It might even make more sense to see two hit splats from this ability because of how the animation plays out. As a side note, this is now two dual wield melee abilities which have no potential for the player to feel good or get creative when using them. They're just generic one splat damage abilities with low cooldowns that you end up using a lot. Slaughter has an important mechanic that triples your damage output, but there's no reward other than a bigger damage splat for triggering this effect. Some sort of sound or visual cue when that movement effect gets triggered is crucial. It's also funny when you trigger Slaughter with a crush weapon. It would actually make a ton of sense if an ability like Slaughter specifically required a stab weapon, but that's a different topic for another episode. Greater Barge. Conceptually a really cool ability that's unique to melee and provides some potential for interesting combos, but it lacks clarity and intuitive play for a few reasons. First, it doesn't alert the player when the effect is ready except by a buff icon, which actually appears one tick too late, so reacting to the buff icon means the player has lost a tick. Second, there's no meaningful difference or reward visually or sound effect wise if the barge bleed effect is active. All you get is a provoke buff icon. Third, the animation for applying a bleed is just slaughter. Players need to be given a clear reaction opportunity on the barge buff, some sort of persistent effect that starts to visualize one tick before it can actually be applied, so players can react to the effect and make greater barge an overall more intuitive experience. Greater barge's bleed effect should also have some sort of unique animation associated with it. The ability Sever, with an icon of someone severing a limb, makes sense, we sever a tendon and reduce their damage output, let's use it! Stab. This is a good example of animations just being inconsistent with the ability icon in the description. The debuff icon also should only have a tooltip of damage reduced by 10%. Hurricane, or Tornado. It's overall a fine ability in terms of clarity, although the sound effect still sounds like you're not hitting anything. An increasingly more impactful sound effect that scales with the number of targets hit could improve player satisfaction and reinforce that you did a good job by hitting more than one target. The sound effect changes when used with a Hailbird, which increases the ability's range by one tile. The new sound suggests that you're hitting multiple times rather than the range has increased, so a better indication for the increased AoE is important. Quake! Overall fine, it sounds good and the spikes show the AoE, but it still suffers from the Hailbird range issue. Greater Flurry. The animation and sound effects honestly aren't very cool. It kind of looks and sounds like you're air cutting a bunch of vegetables from an anime. It doesn't feel impactful or satisfying. Generally, more sword clang effects have better impact. As a side note, Greater Flurry affects the cooldown of another ability. Cooldown refreshing or reduction should be more clear on our action bar. If an ability's cooldown is reduced or refreshed, some sort of flashy effect on the affected ability icon is one way to communicate that something happened. Cleave. Again, overall fine, but I still don't really know how the AoE of this ability works. What does a cone in front of you even mean? This is an extension of the general AoE problem, which again, worsens with a Hailbird. Berserk. One of the most used melee ultimates. It unexpectedly lets you weave an auto attack in without you even noticing, because no attack animation plays, but I'll go into more detail on this later. Berserk lacks a persistent effect. At a glance, it's tough to tell if your character is in complete Berserk mode or not. Where's the Super Saiyan hair? Berserk would benefit from a persistent effect which can better communicate that Berserk is close to expiring. With abilities like Berserk, which are seen as windows of power, you have to make the player feel powerful in that window beyond just bigger numbers. Really sell that power fantasy to boost player satisfaction. Bladed Dive. Again, conceptually a cool ability, but the animation looks more like a headbutt dive, and the sound effect is just... surge cut short. And the damage visual effect is... havoc. 
but an ability as cool and versatile as Bladed Dive should be given the animation, visual, and sound effect love that it deserves, mostly to boost player satisfaction. Including a special effect when the cooldown is refreshed would be rewarding as well. Before we move on to range, I want to quickly give a shout out to the animations and sound effects for auto attacks. They're actually really well done. They have varied swings, satisfying impact sounds, and overall they just look good. There's a few issues such as delayed running and occasionally missed animations, especially if you hold weapons with varying speeds, but it's proof that Jagex can do cool combat animations. It is a shame that we almost never see these auto attack animations in actual combat because abilities override them. Let's move on to range. Now, Melee had a ton of unique animations for every ability, but it almost looks like by the time Jagex got to range, they realized that they spent all their animation budget and time on melee, so they ended up reusing a bunch of animations for range abilities. Piercing Shot, Fragmentation Shot, Corruption Shot, Ricochet, Snapshot, and Rapid Fire all use the same generic windup animation, with maybe a slight variance in visual effects, but they all have the same projectile. Variance in combat animations keeps us engaged and satisfied, and range feels like it lacks that. Piercing Shot like Slice and Punish, doesn't reward or notify the player that they've successfully comboed by hitting a bound target. Rapid Fire. The animation desyncs and can't keep up with the speed of projectiles. The ability does a good job of matching damage splats to shots fired, but the animation needs some cleaning up. The sound effect is also closer to firing like an electric gun rather than a bow or crossbow, so it might be worth giving Rapid Fire a more satisfying and relevant sound effect. Snapshot. It lacks impact for what is considered a really powerful DPS ability. It uses the same sound effect as Rapid Fire, which it shouldn't, because it's only one instance of that Rapid Fire sound effect, which relatively sounds much weaker. The projectile should also be split up a little bit more to really sell the you fire two powerful shots fantasy. Greater Ricochet. I don't actually own this ability, so I have to steal some footage. The extra hit splats from the effect of this ability just kind of appear there's no indication of what's happening. Imagine some sort of actual ricochet effect where projectiles ricochet off the target and fly back to them. These types of changes would better communicate what's actually happening when you use the ability. Binding Shot. It actually has a great animation and visual, although the stun effect is a little dated. The stun effect appears regardless of whether or not the target was actually stunned though, which makes the ability unclear. Type Bindings no different than Binding Shot, looks and sounds the exact same. It needs a more powerful visual and sound effect to clearly indicate the power increase. Snipe suffers from all general channeled ability issues. Revolution also fires the ability after Snipe one tick later than it should. Bombardment. The impact visual effects are delayed, and they linger for a couple seconds, which suggests that there's some sort of ongoing effect. But really, all targets get hit at the same time so you end up with misleading visuals, and the ability generally suffers from AoE clarity issues. Route and Demoralize. This section will also talk about the magic equivalents, Shock and Horror. When the Scare Tactics ability book was released, I was honestly really disappointed in Jagex. They managed to add four abilities to the game which were ultimately not meaningful, and worsened class diversity. Previously, only melee had the option of knocking a target back, but targets will only get knocked back if they take up one tile, and there's so few cases where you want to push a small target back. It's also a noob trap combo with Fragmentation Shot because generally, you're much better off walking the target and using a more powerful ability rather than using Route to push them back. These four abilities also look the exact same. There's no unique visuals to distinguish them at all. The sound effects are pretty cool though. These abilities need to be given unique effects for each class, but we'll discuss class diversity in another episode. Shadow Tendrils. This ability is full of unclear visuals and unintuitive interactions. Shadow Tendrils, a really powerful damaging ability, isn't actually classified as a damaging ability, so you can weave an auto attack in while using the ability. It also uses the standard range ability projectile in addition to a very delayed tendril visual effect which doesn't actually have any meaning or visual value, and it actually overrides almost any other visual effect. Let's talk about auto attack weaving for a minute. Auto attacks are actually a huge DPS booster, 
but their use cases are almost all a result of unintuitive mechanics. Certain abilities are classified as non-damaging, so they don't refresh your auto attack cooldown. If your auto attack is available when you use one of these non-damaging abilities, you can fire off a free auto attack, and this increases your DPS substantially. Your auto attack cooldown is based on the last weapon you used, and auto attacks from average speed weapons deal way more damage, but they obviously have a higher cooldown. If you use an ability with an average speed weapon, your auto attack cooldown is set to average speed. So players can combine these tricks to shoot more frequent powerful auto attacks by switching to faster weapons. You can read up on the intricacies of auto attacks in the PVM Discord. In this case, if I use two abilities with a bow and then fire Shadow Tendrils, I won't get off an auto attack during Shadow Tendrils because my auto attack cooldown has not expired. If I fire off two abilities with a bow, and then switch to crossbows and fire off an ability, and then switch back to my bow and fire off shadow tendrils, I can weave in an auto attack with my bow because my auto attack cooldown was set to something much lower because my last ability was used with crossbows. The massive problem with auto attacks here is that none of this is intuitive. You pretty much can't learn this interaction between auto attacks and abilities at all because it's not something the player expects and it's never explained in any way. As a result, end game PVM and good DPSing suffers from gatekeeping. You have to do research to even discover that these interactions exist. Readability drops even further, especially for spectators, if the auto attack crits. It just looks like Shadow Tendril strikes twice, so even a player who's used Shadow Tendrils before won't understand why there's two hits. Shadow Tendrils is conceptually a cool ability, but visually fails to deliver on its actual power and impact. Imagine a tendril flying out from the shadows to stab the target in a high impact way, but that tendril splits and also stabs the player. We really want to sell the fantasy of abilities to make combat feel good and exciting. Needle Strike. A good example of a unique animation, although the projectile is a little weird. The animation visual doesn't really make sense with the projectile either, so you end up with an odd mismatch of visuals. The damage buff of Needle Strikes is also not communicated at all. There's no buff for the player, no debuff for the target, and nothing about your next hit visually shows that your damage was increased because you used Needle Strikes. A simple fix could be applying the difference in damage increase as a separate hit spot. In general though, this is another example of not rewarding the player visually and thematically for using an abilities effect. Corruption Shot. It uses Needle Strikes impact visual effects which kind of cheapens the ability. It could benefit from a unique animation or impact visual. The persistent visual effect can also override any existing visual effects that are on the target. Ranged auto attacks. Crossbows actually look and sound pretty cool, although the projectile visual arc looks weird, especially as you get closer to the target. Bow animations are decent, except for cases where drawback visuals don't exist. Pulling from a non-existent quiver is also a little bit weird. I personally think bows sound a little bit too mechanical. I'd like to hear more classic archery sounds from bows. Let's talk about magic. Magic is an exciting RPG fantasy for players. The idea of casting spells and making use of elements is really cool, and players feel good when that fantasy delivers. In RuneScape, we select a magic spell to cast as our combat spell. But here's the new player experience. Say I set my spell to Water Strike because hey, I think water spells are pretty cool. I then initiate combat, and my revolution bar uses Combust and then Dragon Breath. My decision to choose water didn't actually have a meaningful impact on my abilities, other than a weakness, which actually does nothing if you're already capped on hit chance. Magic also has these really cool animations that are just not used, and the elements aren't well explored. There isn't even a visually Earth-centric magic ability. A player's choice to use an element should in some way be reflected by how their spell abilities look, to better sell the fantasy of magic. It would also be cool if their spell selection had an impact on how abilities work, but again, another topic for another episode. Like range, magic reuses the same animation for a lot of abilities. Rack, Combust, Impact, Deep Impact, Chain, Corruption Blast all look the exact same animation-wise. Rack. 
Same issue as all other stun enhanced abilities. There needs to be a distinction when the player correctly attacks a bound target. Dragon Breath. This ability used to have the same AoE as Cleave, which made absolutely zero sense for magic, so the AoE was changed to better fit the class, but the visual effect was never updated. Dragon Breath is quite possibly the most misleading ability in the game. It also fulfills a very specific fantasy which locks magic into being a fire-breathing class. The visuals and fantasy of this ability need to be reworked completely. The effect itself is fine, but even changing it to something like launching a ray of your current element at a target that explodes and deals AoE damage would visually make more sense and better fulfill the player fantasy. Combust. It uses the exact same visual effect as Fragmentation Shot. It should have a unique visual, and if possible, redesigned visually entirely to be more spell agnostic rather than forced fire. For example, maybe the spell summons a rift above a target that rains some element. If the target moves, that rift widens and rains down twice as fast. This fulfills both player fantasy and properly communicates that target moving equals more damage. Corruption Blast. It uses the exact same sound, animation, and visual as Combust, except for an added purple projectile, which is desynced from the impact visual. The corruption effect also lacks visual clarity around how it spreads. Some sort of projectile showing the spread between targets would be nice to see. Impact. The impact visual and damage spot are desynced, and the projectile has the same arc issues as all others, making it look glitchy, especially up close. The sound effect is also kind of ear piercing. Deep Impact also looks and sounds the exact same. It needs a more distinct visual and sound effect to better communicate the power increase. Concentrated Blast. A combination of channel animation issues and projectile animation issues, which we've gone over a few times now. The impact visual and projectile desync makes it look buggy. Chain. Honestly, I just wish the projectile was actually a chain and the sound effects were chainy sounds. The chain doesn't really fulfill the fantasy that it has the potential to. Wild magic. Very disappointing visually. You either twirl your staff or kamehameha your wands, which launches two firebolts? Even when you're casting powerful shadow spells from the ancient past, you still just twirl some firebolts for this spell. If wild magic is going to use visual effects from standard spells rather than something unique, you may as well at least make us launch whatever spell we're currently casting. Both the animations and the sounds involved don't really sell the power of the ability because you're just using your staff to launch a projectile. I'd like to see a staff be used more to channel magical power rather than launch projectiles. Jagex can get really creative with visuals for any high impact magic ability. High impact abilities need similarly high impact visuals and effects. Detonate. This ability is so nuanced and full of unintuitive effects that it literally has its own dedicated section in the PBM Discord. Ask someone who hasn't looked up Detonate to try and use it for the first time, they'll likely fail to cast it. It's a unique ability which requires being recast in order to actually apply damage, but there's no indication at all that the ability can even be recast because it's on cooldown. It's also extremely easy to accidentally cancel the ability and get no value from it. Immediately after Detonate is cast, you can also launch both an auto attack and an ability all in one tick, which can result in three or more hit splats, and just has zero readability. It's the single worst example of intuition in the game, and often requires deep explanation and lots of toying with to make good use of. If your Detonate is fully charged, but you try to just use another ability, Detonate will cancel. You have to explicitly input an ability use and Detonate cast in the same cycle to get them both off. Revolution will do this for you, but it just ends up looking unclear, and weaving an auto attack in requires another input, one that players won't intuitively realize is even an option. The ability needs some serious cleanup, so that those who haven't read the detonate essay can still use the ability meaningfully. Asphyxiate. Overall a decent animation and ability fantasy, but it suffers from standard channeling issues. It could easily be cleaned up by aligning the green pulse with each hit splat appearing. Smoke Tendrils. One of the first ability unlocks that early players get access to, as it only requires the completion of a low level quest. Weirdly though, this ability's tooltip is inferior to Asphyxiate in literally every possible way. Smoke Tendrils deals less damage, also damages the user, doesn't stun the target, 
takes longer to channel, and has a higher cooldown. A player who reads and compares these tooltips won't ever see Smoke Tendrils as a valuable ability to use. I have seen players say that Smoke Tendrils has an undocumented crit mechanic, which has combo potential, but again, this isn't mentioned anywhere. From the perspective of someone new to combat, they'll read Smoke Tendrils and wonder why it even exists. It should feel distinct and unique from Asphyxiate, but functionally it's inferior in five different ways. It also suffers from the standard channeled ability issues. Metamorphosis. MMORPG players typically spend a ton of time designing their player avatar to express themselves, even if it's kind of a degenerate expression. Transmog abilities like Metamorphosis take away from this fantasy. Basically, don't ever replace the player avatar model with something entirely else. It doesn't feel good. The visuals of this ability need to be refreshed to apply some sort of persistent effect that doesn't totally replace the character model. Omnipower. A cool concept, but the visuals look glitchy, and with the animation and visual effects overlap issue, it often loses its impact effect. For example, if I cast Omnipower and then Combust, my Combust overrides the Omnipower impact. An ultimate ability should always feel good to use. But Omnipower is the only ultimate new players have access to until level 66 magic. It needs to be a high impact, high satisfaction ability to build interest in the game. The reaction you want from players is, ooh, I wonder what cool things I could do at even higher levels. But right now, Omnipower falls flat in both visuals and even combat effect. Tsunami. Rising up with the wave actually looks really cool, and it's a good example of fulfilling a fantasy. But the wave itself kind of looks like a blanket, not really the greatest water visual effects. The damage splat also appears before the wave crashes, and the impact lacks that oomph. Suffers from the same which squares that I actually affect issue as other AoEs, and the sound effect also either doesn't play sometimes or is so weak or unimpactful that I never really care. Tsunami also awkwardly requires players to be in much closer range than where they might be standing typically. Players have to run up to a specific spot, target a specific mob, and then use the ability. There's a cool opportunity here if the player could choose where to summon the wave, and crashed it down in an AoE from any location, although this would require a different targeting system that allowed the player to target the ground specifically. This does exist in the game with Bladed Dive, though. Lastly, we'll go through some defense abilities. Like always, we want to improve clarity and player satisfaction. Improvements to buff icons, particularly duration as we explored earlier, would really help many self-buff defense abilities. A common theme with defense abilities will be including persistent effects to show you still have the buff, as well as additional positive feedback when a defense ability is used effectively. Anticipation provides a self-buff which reduces incoming damage and blocks stuns. Stun blocking is high impact, but the ability falls flat in fantasy delivery. The animation is a neck crack? Okay. The damage you reduce with anticipation isn't shown anywhere, so the player doesn't get any positive feedback that they've blocked a good amount of damage. More importantly, there's no positive feedback when a player successfully prevents a stun with anticipation. Informing the player that they correctly use an ability is important, it's sort of a high five. This can be presented as a visual effect, a special hit splat, stun immune text popping up, an audio cue, or some combination of those. Freedom. The animation is a little boring, and the roar isn't really satisfying. Freedom should have a special video or audio cue when successfully breaking a stun or bleed. The goal here is improving clarity and player satisfaction. Let's reward players for using freedom effectively to clear a debuff. Resonance. It's actually a pretty good animation, as a successful block is communicated with a heal splat, although it would be helpful if the player's shield stayed lit until the effect was consumed. Preparation has a distinct added sound and visual effects, although it still uses Resonance's sound and visual effects as well. Distinct animations and sound effects can help distinguish between abilities and improve readability, especially for spectators. Preparation should also have some sort of successful indicator that Resonance's cooldown has been altered. Reflect. Same issue as Preparation. It could use a slightly different visual effects and animation to distinguish it from Preparation and Resonance. The Reflect component is reasonably well communicated with Reflect hit splats. We could improve player satisfaction by also showing how much damage was reduced. Revenge. A good, unique sound effect and distinct enough visuals. 
it would benefit from buff icon improvements, but it might also benefit from some sort of persistent visual effect, and having that visual effect grow with stacks. All of this can boost the satisfaction for using the ability correctly. Debilitate, a really strong effect, but very weak visuals, which is even worse with ranger magic. You kick the air and suddenly the target deals 50% less damage to you. Debilitate would benefit with a very unique visual and sound effect to better sell the fantasy of debuffing your target, as well as notification of how much damage you've actually reduced. Immortality, a cool ability with cool use cases. It could do with a persistent effect to show the second life buff more clearly, but ultimately it delivers a reasonably satisfying rebirth effect, which is really cool to see. Barricades. A persistent visual effect would be nice. It would benefit greatly from improved buff icons. Some text that shows how much damage was blocked could also improve player satisfaction and game feedback. Devotion. Pretty decent animation and sound effect, but it could benefit from updating the overhead prayer icon to better communicate the temporary increase in their power. I want to give a very special shout out and thank you to the people behind the PVM Discord and the RuneScape Wiki. I referenced these two resources endlessly while making this video. You provided context on some combat mechanics that I couldn't figure out. Thank you so much for the time, effort, and care you put into providing RuneScape players with combat knowledge. Remember, combat is an incredibly extensive and complex topic. This episode was a non-exhaustive list of opportunities to improve combat readability and player satisfaction. I'm also not claiming to have perfect insight into RuneScape combat. I may have made mistakes throughout the video, given incorrect information, or made a point that you don't agree with. There's also instances of clarity and player satisfaction that I didn't cover, but my hope is Jagex and the community can use this as a starting point to address these issues over time and ensure that they are top of mind when designing new combat updates. We should engage in healthy discussion with Jagex to truly make combat a fun experience for everyone. To continue this conversation and truly make it a community experience, I have created a Project Combat Discord server which everyone, especially those new to combat, is welcome to join and discuss this video and share their feedback and experiences. Next episode will focus on topics like class diversity, the combat triangle, and accuracy and hit chance. Here's a quick teaser of some ideas that I'll have for next episode. Update Escape to Escape Shot. An ability that lets you jump back four tiles and fire a single shot at your target, which deals damage. Then, your next two abilities have an increased range of four tiles. Then we update Snipe with a new effect. Snipe's damage is increased by X% percent for every tile between you and your target. We've now created a unique way for rangers to express some skill by dodging mechanics with an ability, and we've offered a cool combo opportunity with Snipe. Reworking Chains with a new effect. Binding chains burst out from your target and tether to three nearby enemies, dealing damage. If the spell is channeled for 1.8 seconds, all tethered targets are pulled towards your initial target, dealing further damage to tethered targets. Greater chains would still cause your next ability to deal 50% damage to all tethered targets. Thank you so much for watching, I can't wait to see what we can build together.